welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer and as ever I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time then welcome. Usually on this podcast we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. There are six complete seasons of this podcast exploring slashers, ghost stories, folk horror, zombie movies, occult movies and psychological and body horror and we are currently in the middle of our seventh series exploring the evolution of alien, sci-fi and cosmic horror and a new episode of that is released every Friday. However, this is a little bonus episode because we couldn't resist the chance to cover the long-awaited release of Nia da Costa's Candyman. Uh, so this is a movie that it feels like we've all been waiting for for such a long time. The release of it was delayed from last year due to COVID, um, but it's finally out in cinemas, written and directed by Nia da Costa, produced by Jordan Peele. Uh, I've finally seen the movie and I've got so much to discuss. Um, so as ever with new releases, we're going to split this week's episode into two halves. In the first half of this episode, you're going to hear a spoiler-free chat between me and my guest. We're going to reveal very little about the plot we're just going to discuss our thoughts and our reactions to the movie then we will give you ample spoiler warning before we discuss the movie in spoilerific details so please go away and check out the film particularly before you listen to the second half of our discussion so joining me to discuss all things Candyman, I've got a brand new guest. Now you may recognise her from uh, the Final Girls podcast, she's been on there a whole bunch of times. Uh, she also writes for Little White Lies, Sight and Sound, Total Film, The AV Club and a whole bunch of other places. Uh, so it's an honour to have her here joining me. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Layla Latif. Hello Layla. Hi, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, how are you doing? How's your 2021 been? Um, less of a nightmare than 2020 um and certainly mm-hmm. it's kind of much better to be a film journalist in a slightly more stable time for film releases and we're getting some of the ones that we would have gotten last year including this film which i started writing about about 14 months ago <laughs> and now it's finally here oh my god this is amazing it really does feel like this is a film we've all been waiting for for a long time i feel like as a horror fan i've been talking for about two years about like oh that new Candyman's coming soon oh that new can you know and it's like it's finally here Amazing. yeah it's finally here <laughs> Halloween Kills is finally here although I think that Halloween Kills has had a little bit of the wind taken out of its sails by them saying that it's the second of a trilogy oh. <laughs> it's just like well then what can really conclude in this <laughs> what a stupid idea that was I know what was right. what what a silly thing but yeah we're all still excited about it. I'll still be there on night one, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about the new Candyman. We'll have a little spoiler-free chat, first of all. But I've got to ask you, first of all, Layla, about your own relationship with the original Candyman as well. Are you a fan? Have you always been a fan of the original Candyman? Huge fan of the original Candyman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in Sudan, where I'm actually currently recording from. Very cool. Um, and uh, we have a very weird thing when it comes to cable in Africa, where there's no like... Um, you know, things just things being kind of uh, late at night so that children don't watch them. So you could occasionally come home at two in the afternoon from school and just kind of put on, you know, Hellraiser as a seven year old. <laughs> so I think I probably watched Candyman at like a horrifically young age. And I had that image seared into my mind from very from a very young time. And, you know, as a black person, he was such a kind of beautiful grand Shakespearean presence. And I think that's almost more what I took from it than the actual horror of it. Just like this majestic figure of Tony Todd. And I think certain things do go over your head as a, when you're younger as well. I think only kind of recently have I come to it and been like, oh God, he castrates a child and that sort of thing. So in a weird way, this retelling of Candyman sort of fits in better with my early impression of him as the anti-hero. Anti-hero is perfect, isn't it? He's not just your typical Freddy, Jason type character Candyman, is he? And I think that's what that's what always strikes me about this movie. I think the original Candyman, which I've talked about at length on the podcast, but I think is a masterpiece. I think it's one of the greatest horror movies ever made. The more times I watch it, the more I think, this is one of the best films ever made, full stop, really. Um, I think it's perfect. But what it isn't is a kind of monster movie slasher film, like a teen slasher. And I think that's what a lot of people 
think of Candyman as. I think in our memory, we think of Candyman as that movie about that boogeyman that jumps out in the mirror when you say his name five times, right? And it's so different to that when you actually watch the film. Yeah, it seems kind of weirdly ahead of its time looking at it now, where you kind of have these very like complicated motives. And even I mean, I think Helen is equally is a far more compelling character than I had remembered her as being coming to it now. Like she... I mean, she really, like, she does have that kind of white savior complex, but I think to Bernard Rose's credit, he was aware of that, that this is kind of like a woman who has a level of, like, foolish bravado and trying to understand a community that she simply doesn't. That's so true. Yeah, there's, and it doesn't really talk about it overtly in the text, does it? But it feels like all of that is going on, this idea of this incredibly privileged, quite arrogant slash ignorant woman um, and that kind of confidence that she has when she strolls into Cabrini Green. And you can see that in the performance of not just Virginia Madsen, but also Casey Lemons, right, playing Bernadette, who is subtly brilliant, I think, as her black friend who goes on that journey with her. Yeah, even the kind of ideas of gentrification are so present in that earlier one when you've got kind of Helen's building and she realises that it's um, basically been constructed in the same way as the projects are and Mm -hmm. kind of the divisions between like what is a gentrified building and what is kind of something that needs to be condemned is kind of entirely arbitrary exactly so yeah first movie we're all in agreement right pretty legit masterpiece uh, there were also two sequels Layla I don't know if you're familiar with them I don't know if you've seen them but we also got Candyman 2 Farewell to the Flesh in 1995 and Candyman 3 Day of the Dead in 1999 uh, how familiar are you with these movies I think I may have seen not the first sequel Sequel, but the second sequel but I'm very here for these kind of crap sequel erasures where we're just gonna ignore all the sequels and start again like why not it's so true isn't it there is such a trend of that at the moment I love it so um so let's do it with all that being said let's talk about this now long-awaited sequel Candyman it's just called Candyman and it it's not a remake it is a spiritual sequel to the original movie written and directed by Nia DaCosta Candy man. The urban legend is, if you say his name five times while looking in the mirror, he appears in the reflection and kills you. Who would do that? Candyman. 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 Well, we're still alive. Uh, so this is set, um, you know, in the present day and the events of um, the original Candyman have all happened. But what we're kind of led to believe over the course of the film is the original Candyman was sort of filled with unreliable narrators and a different lens to this one. So whilst it is actually a direct sequel to the events, it does keep asking you to question who told you that original story. So it's um, Anthony McCroy, who is a visual artist and something of a wunderkin living in a gentrified, beautiful apartment in Chicago, which is just, I mean, that kitchen. Oh, my God. (laughs) The interiors of this film. Unbelievable. I digress, but my God, it was like just these like beautiful navy blues and just some kind of arranged artichokes on a marble table. (laughs) But yeah, so they're kind of really living this incredibly stylish, beautiful life in um in a very smart part of Chicago. And he's got, I guess, the equivalent of writer's block, but with art, and it's like struggling to kind of find some new inspiration. And he gets interested in the myth of Candyman and starts creating art around him and sort of foolishly, in many ways, like Helen did, just assumes that this is an urban legend and uh, invites the hook-handed man into his life to, uh, with devastating consequences, shall we say. Indeed. Perfect. Perfect. So, uh, Leila, what did you think of it? Are you a fan of the new Candyman? I am a fan of the new Candyman. I have a few issues with it. My main issue is that the trailer, like you just told me to not give away any spoilers. I wish somebody who had made the trailer had done the same thing. Right. Because I felt a few of the surprise. I mean, you can't really blame the film for this, but I think a lot of the surprises were taken away from me from the actual trailer. Aside from that, I do think it was a little overly compact. It's weird because I'm always complaining about films being too long. I do think that this needed 15 more minutes. Some interpersonal relationships are down to literally a single scene. 
But on the whole, I think it was fantastic. I think Nia da Costa really has like distinguished herself as like an extraordinary visionary. The performances were great. I think it really gives itself a reason to exist by bringing in these cool new ideas about, you know, the black lens and unreliable narrators and who gets to be an anti-hero and who gets to be a knight saving the day and who's a, you know, dastardly vision. I think it was really fascinating and urgent and cool and yeah big fan yeah i couldn't agree more and just to echo everything you said really i mean first of all i am i and i know this is very difficult for film journalists to do so i understand it may be impossible but i always avoid trailers i basically have just since about two or three years ago i was like you know what i'm done watching trailers and i and i have not really watched a trailer since and i i have never i've watched the Candyman trailer now having watched the film to see what it was like Mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right it gives away far too much and i know you may not be in a position to be able to do this but i would recommend layla just giving up watching trailers because it's the best thing then you go into watching these films not not knowing at all what you're in for and it's uh it's awesome <laughs> oh that's really nice okay i might have to try and do this but in my defense mm. i interviewed nia da costa and they wouldn't give me the film so all i had was the trailer yeah that's <laughs> I probably it watched it about 14 times i mean that's what i mean and i know and like i say as a film journalist or a film writer sometimes you have to you you have to as, as your job obviously but um i mm. i think if you can avoid it absolutely avoid it because you're right there's there's a lot of really fun surprises in this film. And I completely, I was going to say exactly what you said, which is my one complaint about it is that at times it felt a bit rushed. It's a 90 minute film. And I, I never say this, but I could have done with another 30 minutes. I could have been like, yeah. I really, I was enjoying it so much. And some of it, particularly in the final act for me, felt a little bit like, well, oh, what's happening now? You know, like I kind of wish it had taken its time a little bit, like you say, with a few character beats, so we could kind of get there in a bit more of an organic way. Um, but that is, I mean, to have that complaint is a pretty good thing, really, that I kind of wanted more of it, I suppose. Um, because generally speaking, I loved this movie. Uh, this movie absolutely met my expectations. You know, like I mentioned, I'm a huge fan of the original. I was... So hoping this would be as good as I wanted it to be. And I was nervous. But my God, it it pretty much gave me everything I wanted. I think this is a really beautiful piece of work. It's a, a deep and layered film. It's got a lot of meaty themes that I think we're going to want to discuss. But it's also just a really fun slasher horror ghost movie you know it's it ticks all the boxes for me yeah and well i think it's very interesting how they they start to delve in a little bit more into like the actual kind of mechanics of how Candyman operates and they bring a lot more of them to that but you're right in the final act they're just like oh yeah it's fine just <laughs> yeah there's a there's a lot that suddenly happens which we'll get to um i think the first hour is like magnificent and i think there are bits for me that fell apart slightly in the end but we'll talk about that later but um but overall i absolutely loved it uh i found it quite genuinely creepy as well and that i don't get that so much these days with with horror movies but i actually think the portrayal of Candyman himself in this one and i won't, won't say too much about it at this stage i found really effective as well did you find this kind of scary in the traditional sense as a horror film yeah i found grotesque i'm a big fan of scary shit in mirrors oh, and so this yeah, was right? like really re- like i love a kind of opening of a, of, a, of a bathroom cabinet only to see something terrifying behind you so <laughs> yeah. i was really firing on a lot of cylinders for my kind of scary mirror love mm. um i just think that it was really inventive with a lot of the scares as well and i think I think you can kind of see Nia da Costa's genre fandom through a lot of that because I mean whilst she wasn't it wasn't so much on the jump scares a lot of the quite grotesque images really did stay with me I loved how little it relied on jump scares actually and there is a type of scare that gets me the most and I don't really have a name for it although somebody on this podcast once called it frame analysis horror like where you like if you're looking at a shot for long enough suddenly you will see somebody stood in a doorway in the background or tony collette up on the ceiling of a dark bedroom right that kind of scare where you suddenly realize there's somebody in the room is my favorite type of scare and i feel like nia da costa plays a lot with that 
type of scare, you know, where almost every single shot has a long corridor or it has a lot of mirrors and reflective surfaces. So, of course, you're constantly looking in mirrors, in the background of shots, you're waiting for somebody to appear. Oh, it's masterful. Yeah, that, that is that. I think I'm with you. I think that is my my preferred scare as well. Mm. I do, on a kind of dark and stormy night, still see Tony Collette in the corner of my bedroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and I think, you know, I'm standing here, you know, uh, well, I'm sitting here in a room with, you know, the lights on and a lot of quite mirrored windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, I know, right? We're, I'm, I'm glad you're on the line <laughs> in case something happens. Well, isn't it amazing as well, Candyman? It is actually amazing in a way that it's not a bigger franchise than it is. You know, it's it's not a movie like Halloween or Friday the 13th that has like 10 entries, but it feels as as well known as that. Like kids, I've got nephews that have never seen any horror movies, but they know about Candyman and they know about if you say his name in the mirror, he comes up. Like it's now become like that kind of folklore, hasn't it? And I remember even as a teenager, friends being too scared to do it. You know, it's one of those things, isn't mm. it? It's such a beautifully simple, spooky premise that I think weirdly sort of taps into something primal in all of us doesn't it i I put so much of that down to tony todd so it is quite interesting that they managed to have that impact without him yes like he's such a remarkable baritone imposing figure that like it's almost like he has such a presence that he almost didn't need to be there just to kind of have this kind of shadow following him just like the very mention of the name and you get his his kind of presence in the room, or in my case, kind of seems to be peeking out behind a bush in the garden that I'm very suspicious of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's so much, like you said when you were talking about the original, there's so much majesty to him, isn't there? There was almost a there's almost a kind of Dracula or vampiric, I feel like, that sort of charisma about him, like that kind of that kind of Bella Lugosi almost like a is almost like a classic monster, isn't he? Where he's kind of magnetic and charming and sexy, as well as being quite terrifying. I suppose he pulls yeah. that off really well. Yeah. I wonder if somebody, I bet it's somewhere on the internet, but if some because he feels like the lead in that film, yeah. and I bet it's a bit like Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs, where if you actually looked at his screen time, it would be something like six minutes. Oh, a hundred percent. 100% it's entirely Helen's film isn't it the the original um and speaking of what did you think of our cast in this one particularly Yaya Abdul-Mateen right who is our star in this particular story yeah he's one of his I, I I think I did see hints of it in Us where he was kind of playing his his dual self mm. that he think he's much more that he's got such kind of action star good looks Right. It's easy to kind of underestimate how like committed he is as a kind of going quite like strange and like going into like a really weird physicality, which I think he did do hints of in us, but obviously that was a much smaller role. Mm-hmm. But I think he yeah, he's a very committed performer, which perhaps me objectifying him, I didn't appreciate how talented he was, even in this film. I mean, they do kind of play around with like how incredibly statuesque and gorgeous he is. And he spends quite a lot of this in his pants, yeah. which yeah, I was, you know, no complaints. But yeah. Um, but yeah, especially in the moments where he was kind of getting into the body horror of it and he's just completely like unraveling psychologically and stuff. I, you know, he really... He really did that with a sort of commitment to ugliness, Mm -hmm. which I enjoyed. Do you think that this movie does lean more into the slasher stuff? Again, we can talk about this more specifically in spoilers, but I, you know... Anyone who's seen the, one of those early teaser trailers, right, will have seen that kind of scene involving girls in a high school and that kind of thing. And it felt like it was leaning more into that that kind of a movie that the first one wasn't. Like I was saying, I think the first one is the one is it, you, you kind of expect it to be that movie and it kind of isn't beyond the opening scene, right? Whereas this movie feels like it maybe it's playing a little bit more to that kind of teen audience. I don't know. What do you reckon? Yeah, so I mean, that, st- that scene does kind of stand out but even within that scene the way that it's framed is very much kind of on a single person's experience of it so yeah i I kind of wouldn't classify it as like as of sasha the death count is pretty high and i suppose there is there is a quite a solid amount of gore but for me God, it's hard to talk about this yeah for me like so the most terrifying scenes had very little 
blood and gore as well. So I think it's kind of a full range of Tony Collette down to <laughs> Drew Barrymore's murder and scream in terms <laughs> yeah. of like the kind of hideous things that we get to see. It's so true, isn't it? It's got a bit of everything and that's it. And it's so packed with ideas and stuff going on that that's it like it like we both said it kind of almost was too pat like i could have just i could have just let it linger a little bit more you know for some of it but it's it, yeah it, but i but it was nice that like there's not there's not two murders that are alike at all no no i mean she just every time she, she has kind of a somebody is being dispatched she just does it in a completely different way yeah, absolutely incredible. And what an amazing eye, right? Like you said, Nia DaCosta has got. This film looks stunning, doesn't it? I kind of wanted to like frame every shot of this movie. You yeah, know? like I said to you, I did most of my notes in the dark, but like almost all of them are about kind of like architecture, yes. corridors, the use of sky. Oh my God, <laughs> it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But yeah, it's got that Inception-esque kind of thing of it's like just constantly like disorienting like the topography and just like you're not quite sure of where angles are and I love the way that she used slow zooms at so many points mm. which is I mean that's possibly the dullest thing that you can ever say on a podcast the no, slow zoom I love like... a slow zoom reminds me of Kubrick or the shit you know like I love a slow zoom absolutely I mean, speaking of Kubrick I do think that like Chicago almost becomes a bit overlook hotel like that it's just like nothing really adds up and you just have this like uneasy sense of like how buildings and rooms and even streets fit together do you think you can feel um jordan peele's kind of imprint on this as well you know how much do you think this is a also sort of jordan peele project because he he sort of wrote it as well didn't he with nia da costa is that right yeah he and a guy called Wit, he wrote it with her and win Rosenfeld, yeah who i think he's written with before mm -hmm. but I, not a hundred percent sure. Mm. I mean, like, yeah, certainly he's got that kind of like satirical edge to it. And I do think it was surprisingly funny at times, yeah. which is probably a bit of Jordan Peele's influence. But I do appreciate and in having interviewed Nia DaCosta, like she was very keen to emphasize that he was just supporting her vision mm -hmm. and like wanted her to fully realize it in the way that she wanted and i think it does feel quite distinct from the other monkey paw films it absolutely does it really does it really felt unique actually in that way i agree um yeah and finally then before we get into spoilers you know is this the sort of film that you think how much again this is very difficult to answer without spoilers i know but how <laughs> much of a sequel is this would you recommend this to people who have never seen Candyman, or let's say haven't revisited Candyman since the 90s does that matter who are these people that haven't I seen Candyman? Man? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> and haven't taken the opportunity <laughs> in the like 14 years, like it seems this film has been about to come out for and not revisited them. Yeah. These are not my people. I would not recommend it to them. <laughs> these... <laughs> You're so right. You're so right. And actually, obviously everyone who listens to this is going to know and love Candyman, but I would recommend to everyone, even if you've seen it a hundred times, watch it again in preparation for this because even though you don't have to i think there are certain things that you'd benefit from having just watched this uh we just watched the original i think as well because there are a few little connections here and there aren't there and i think there's some really interesting even though it stands on its own as a film in its own right i think it actually does really work as a sequel as well do you know what i mean yeah it does and i'd actually say even read the short story the forbidden by clive barker mm. because there are some really cool little references to it as well that like there's some graffiti in one of the early scenes which is an illustration from uh from the book which i really enjoyed Ooh, that's good to know okay and it's short and it's really good yeah there you go which is kind of these are the two things that i look for <laughs> i love uh, it, absolutely absolutely uh so there you go final question before we go into spoilers then would uh, a pretty obvious question but would you recommend this film to horror fans you know people have been looking forward to this film for a long time is it worth the wait uh yes i think it's certainly worth worth the way um i would Definitely follow your advice and try not to watch the trailer. Try not to read about all of the cameos that are going to come up because I do think that that worked against it for me. Mm. But yeah, really, really exciting, interesting film. Makes me very excited for what else we're going to get from Nia DaCosta. I hope she comes back to us after her time at Marvel. Oh, I know. Uh, because I think she's a really interesting, creative person. And as much as I enjoy a Marvel film, I think it sort of creates what it 
you know, it, you make a Marvel film and there's not a huge amount of room to maneuver. And in this totally. film, she's really shown that she's like got quite specific and interesting choices that she'll make. So I know. please come back. Please Mia. come back. Please come back to the horror genre, particularly because she's very good at it. She's done an amazing <laughs> job. Uh, so I don't think we can say anything else, Layla, without going into spoilers. So let's say from this point onwards, we will be talking about Candyman in spoilerific detail. If you haven't seen the movie, stop the episode here, go away, give Candyman a watch and come back. You have been warned. I think it made a mistake. I brought him back. Candyman isn't real! Something's happening to me. He had a purpose for you. To be another one of his terrible stories. I guess he found me. I am the writing on the wall. The sweet smell of blood. So Layla, where do we even start? There are lots of moments and story beats I want to ask you about. But first of all, actually, let me just start off by asking you what you hinted at in the first half there. You said that the negatives for you were that a lot of the surprises you had already seen coming because of the trailer. What moments in particular were you talking about? What cameos, what surprises were ruined for you by the trailer? Um, The thing that annoyed me the most was actually the bathroom scene with the girls Mm -hmm. where they all get killed. Because not only is that like a really fun scene and there's the whole point where it's shown from the perspective of like the black girl that they're sort of slightly bullying uh, but also there's a really great punchline to that scene where Tiana Paris's character says you know who the hell would say Candyman into the mirror five times and it cuts to these teenage girls which I think is a really funny line really good and so I was really good so I had a laugh ruined for me and then it was like oh I also don't get kind of the fun of you know how this is going to be framed because I think it's maybe the fourth death at that point Mm -hmm. and each time it's been so different so it was annoying to have one kind of like oh what's Nia going to do with this one taken away from me but I did really enjoy that scene it reminded me a lot of um let the right one in and the swimming pool scene which is something I love it's yeah you're so right the way that it's kind of just happening off screen yeah so good uh yeah that was a interesting scene to put right in the middle of the film and then to have that in the trailer wasn't it because you'd think if they were going to put a whole scene like that in the trailer you'd at least expect it maybe to be the opening scene or something like that and it's interesting that it is yeah it's it's firmly in the kind of in the middle of the film isn't it by that point um what did you think? I, w- I want to start at the beginning quickly. And, uh, you know, the the fact that we start with that 1970s opening with the little boy and the creepy man with the hook in the walls giving yeah. candy, which turns out to be quite a kind of sweet, innocent story. But what did you think of this? I guess in for the bulk of it, he's the sort of new candy man, isn't he, in a way, this guy? Um, he's the one who we see through quite a lot of the film. Um, what did you think of this new candy man, I suppose? Yeah, it's poor, poor Sherman. <laughs> Sherman, that's it. Yeah, yeah. poor Sherman. Uh, yeah, no, I really like the way that that was set up because they do kind of, you know, I think this thing straight from the beginning about like, we're just going to make you question your assumptions about everything that you see. So we see the first half of that shot and he's emerging from the hole oh, in the wall. It's just like horrific monster and he's terrifying. And then they just, you know, cut away and you, your imagination fills in all these terrible assumptions about him. Yeah. And then we go back to him and see that he's, a tragic figure and a victim. And I think that just kind of sets up the exact, it's like a microcosm of what the entire film turns out to be. Yeah, very I loved it. Yeah, I thought it was a really, it was a really good setup. It was kind of subtle um, and creepy. And then, you know, as tragic a figure as he is, even after you learn about him, he's still a very creepy, he is creepy, right? There's something... Less majestic than Tony Todd, but actually in some ways scarier, I think. More monstrous in a way, I suppose, about his Candyman with the kind of, 
you know, the beaten face and everything else and him kind of, he's often sort of smiling and everything, like whenever we see him appearing in mirrors and that kind of thing. But I found him a very frightening presence and he didn't really talk as much as, Tony Todd talks a mm. lot, doesn't he? <laughs> he's, yeah, I think if you get Tony Todd, you're going to get that voice out of him. I know, right? Travesty. He's having a natter <laughs> every time he's on screen in the original Tony Todd, whereas this guy just sort of quietly smiling and sinister, but a really good, a really different, but a really good kind of new Candyman, I suppose. Yeah, and I suppose that's true to life, isn't it? Because in a way, he is a bit of a weird guy. He just wants to give sweets to kids. He's awkward. He smiles. He kind of doesn't read the room well. And I think that's often the people that are Mm -hmm. victimized, particularly by the police, by society and stuff. If you just sort of are a bit of a weirdo that have a bit of an unsettling presence, like, you are the person that people turn on quite quickly, which makes the whole thing even more tragic. Yeah, you're so right. The way that it starts as well, the film opens with the song Candyman from Willy Wonka, right, as well, is so good. And the and that he is this, in this particular, this particular generation's Candyman was this guy who, this friendly guy who gave candy to kids, you know, like, yeah. I think it is all very clever, all those different layers that it kind of puts on it. Um Yeah, I loved that. And I loved this introduction of this idea that there are several candy men, um, that it's not just Tony Todd. It's like this has been happening generation after generation um, of these, you know, these black men with these horrific things happening to them who then become these kind of folkloric spirits. Uh, I thought that was really great, a really great way of kind of building on the mythology, but also getting around the fact that Tony Todd isn't here, you know, as well. I think it was a really clever thing. Yeah. Yeah, and and just so incredibly sad because, I mean, she's clearly alluding to quite a lot of real-life cases. You've got George Stinney Jr., who famously was uh, executed by the state at the age of 14 for a crime he didn't commit. Mm. And the worst part of that, which they reference in the shadow puppetry, is because he was so small because he was a child when they executed him. They had to put him on a stack of Bibles in order for him to... Oh, my God, you know, for the electric chair. ...reach the helmet. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, this is... You know, she's, I guess this is probably where she deviates from what I recognize more as Peel. Like she goes hard into like black trauma and this is something born out of like a serious and upsetting black pain. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And it's, I mean, a lot of it's difficult viewing. There's a lot of, you know, but it it felt funny because even when I was talking to my editor, when I was writing my review, I was just like, it was really fun aside from all the lynching stuff. (laughs) Oh my god, yeah. But it is it's it's rough at times. And like and it was interesting how much was packed into those 90 minutes because you know, I still had a though see it still was kind of like a sort of space for fun and imagination and stuff that kind of that after kind of the credits rolled and she kind of reminds us all of like these different men who have become candy men it is like i did just feel like i've been punched in the heart being reminded by all of those all of those terrible tragedies and a lot of them really recent tragedies that this film is referencing 100 percent. it doesn't let you off the hook does it in the way that for example get out does the you know famously the 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 teaser of like oh are they police sirens oh no it's his best mate coming to and mm. you end on that kind of real high that feel good ending this is a really kind of quietly devastating ending i think like you said with the puppet show going on through the credits of all the different mm. candy men and everything um yeah like you said it kind of it's not shying away from any of that it's all there and is the root of the horror in this and that's i i, I mean i loved it i loved I mean, it just made the story so much more impactful for me, I think. And kind of, and balancing that with the more kind of campy teen stuff or whatever else, the more genre stuff, and pulling yep. off that balance, which I think she did really well, is 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 no mean feat, really, is it, I think? Yeah, that we had all of that. And I actually mean, did laugh lot, out loud at least four or five times. So, yeah, yeah credit to her. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm wondering whether you felt that, like, I guess the question would be is like, do you think that it was scary enough in between like all of the kind of messaging? Because that's kind of the thing that I came away questioning. It's just like, did we do a bit too much like thesis? Yeah, I think at times it may be verged on 
didactic a little bit, you know? Um, it's where you actually have characters overtly talking about the themes, you know? Everything in the original mm-hmm. Candyman felt like it was bubbling under the surface in sort of subtext, whereas with this movie, it's like, right, wow, straight away, the first time we're introduced to our main characters, they're having that dinner party, and they have a very on-the-nose conversation about gentrification, about mm-hmm. racism, about, you know, it, it, it lays out what this movie is going to be about, doesn't it, in the dialogue in between scares but actually that it didn't bother me it didn't take me out of it like i said i think nia da costa has such a brilliant eye uh she makes everything look so incredible and so tense and suspenseful that i was always compelled and on edge from beginning to end you know watching what was happening in the frame but what about you did did it bother you that kind of slightly didactic kind of nature to it i think for me it kind of depended who was talking i think Colman Domingo is probably the person that handled that the best. Yes. But there was a particular scene where Anthony's talking to a white art critic where I was just like, this is not what I recognize as human conversation. Yeah, right. <laughs> that kind of spouting theory back at one another. Well, because it's also right. This film is also, it feels like it's also got quite a lot to say about uh, artists critics Mm -hmm. uh you know this kind of generation of young artists and this kind of thing i mean like i found all of that really fun and quite satirical and interesting and there's that kind of quite quite stereotypical portrayal of the sort of mean critic and you're right that that conversation they have about art and the way it's perceived and you know art about murders and all that stuff again very on the nose that Nia da Costa is kind of talking about what she's doing with this film right but it, again it, it didn't bother me too much and and it also you know that's another big meaty theme that this film is juggling right as well as everything else this is also a movie about art right and about what it means to be an artist and the importance of art and the struggle of art um that's kind of all in there too right yeah I think I found that most interesting in the sort of relationship between the the gallery owner and Anthony yeah. where there was like the conversations where they had, where I think it was a little bit more subtle and he was just kind of essentially saying to him, like you're making art about the black experience, but you need to make it digestible to me. And I was like, Hmm, interesting. I wonder what he is referring to. Yeah. It's so true. <laughs> and I enjoyed that quite a lot more, but I think once it got down to like the critic, it was, I mean, I appreciated that the whole thing throughout is we are constantly having people tell each other stories and it's not just kind of white people telling the black story. Like it works the same way around that we have at one point, Nathan Jarrett Smith's character Mm -hmm. explaining Helen's story and getting it wrong. And then we have Helen's narration, you know, explaining things wrong and the white critic explaining gentrification wrong and everybody just sort of in like bad faith and just misinterpreting one another and unreliant narrators, which I was like so into and I'm forgetting what my original point was. Oh, but yeah, I just did think that there was a point where he was sitting in the art critic's apartment discussing it with her and I was a little bit like, okay, I I get it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you think there is a... um a version of this film could it be seen as you know almost in the kind of in the way that the shining you know you could look at it as just a story of a man losing his mind essentially is there a reading of this film that is actually just the story of a man anthony losing his grip on reality a a struggling artist um a man who maybe thinks he deserved more from his life from his career um, frustrated male ego in a way um, snapping because most of the victims right are people that do him wrong in the story um, is there a way you could actually read this movie as not supernatural in that way uh, possibly I don't know what those teenage girls would have done to deserve that <laughs> that's a good point that is kind of the that is kind of the anomaly isn't it that scene in a way. yeah yeah every, <laughs> everything else <laughs> totally um yeah, well, that's yeah that was interesting but it's it, i suppose it's that thing that we were talking about earlier where it was a little breakneck we could have had a few moments to breathe because in particular with that teenage girl scene and they have a moment of like oh is Candyman coming in somewhat 
a bit like let the right one in to save this black girl who's trapped in the bathroom stall. Mm-hmm. And I could have done with a with a minute to sit with that because I because yeah, otherwise it does feel like a bit of an anomaly of a scene. Mm-hmm. It does, and I guess it's 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 all about that idea of he's resurrecting the legend again, isn't he? And he's 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 sparked he sparked the fear back into Candyman again. Um, let me ask you about some of these other sort of reveals, twists, I suppose, in the story. Obviously, there is the reveal that Anthony is the baby from hmm. the original Candyman. You know, Anne Marie's son, which I loved. Um, there is the sort of twist that there are sort of multiple Candymen, um, one in each generation, in a way. Um, uh, which was a really cool idea and twist on the original. Um, the one that didn't sit so well with me that I'd love to ask you about is the sudden revelation that Coleman Domingo's character is this kind of crazed villain yeah. when he just goes mad in the church in the final act and yeah. saws off Anthony's hand. At that point, I did feel a bit like I had sort of whiplash. I was like, hang I, on, what? what's happening now? But I think anyone but Coleman Domingo it would have been <laughs> completely unhinged. Like, I can't remember what the line is, but he he says something like they're in a church and he references that and he says like, oh, I guess I'm on some other shit now. Yeah. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yeah. this is brilliant. And then apropos of nothing is just like sucking on a razor blade. Yes, <laughs> like yes. Just... He... But yeah, no, it goes completely unhinged. But I like those little touches. I like that when this kind of, the hand is being sawn off, Anthony's just silently crying. And like, that's such a kind of, weird, unusual choice. You'd kind of either have him doing nothing, I suppose, or kind of screaming in agony, but there's something so horrific about silent tears Mm -hmm. in that moment. He is just brilliant, isn't he? All the way throughout. I think he pitches it just right. And even though the the body horror gets very extreme very fast, right? It's like that Mm. bee sting about, again, this is where I felt like it maybe could have benefited from being a bit longer because it's about two scenes later and that bee sting is now just like infected beyond, you know, repair. Yeah. You're like, oh my God, how did this happen all of a sudden, you know? And what is it about fingernail body horror oh. that is the worst of all the body horror? It really I think somebody is. needs to do some sort of psychological study on why we are so particularly attached to our fingernails because I could watch a live vivisection more easily than I could watch a thumbnail come off. You are so right. Every time fingernails make me absolutely wince, um, you know, and there, it is like it's it's like something out of the fly, isn't it? What he goes through in this movie, it's really extreme, and I loved all of that. It was really gross, but it was brilliant. But he really sold it, you know. It was mm. yeah, wonderful. The um, only thing that I kind of came to when they were sort of like doing that common Domingo, like I'm going to sum up everything that happens, and it wasn't until afterwards I was like. Sorry, sorry, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, a little bit like, I didn't, for as much as this film sort of likes to go, is kind of purporting to go into like how the actual mechanics of Candyman works and how he's created and the perspective and stuff. I don't think I had a sense at the end of what Candyman's agency is within any moment where he's summoned. Right. And this has always been something that's confused me even in the first film, right? Because sometimes he will appear straight away and murder whoever says his name and then other times mm-hmm. he will i don't know just kind of follow you about and frame you right like essentially which he does right. to helen and then he does to uh to anthony in this one but um and the kind of the rules of so you know anthony's girlfriend brianna right she's with him when he says the name five times in the reflection but she's not affected mm-hmm. by it. And there's all those things you think about, right, with regards to the rules. It's like, what if you say it three times now and then twice next week? Does that count? Yeah. What if it's a different mirror next week? What if you're stood next to somebody else that's saying it, but you're not saying it? Yeah, I mean, I was, I've been trying to think about it a little bit more and almost all of my takes are pretty depressing where I was just like, oh, so this is like they're showing us that it's like white supremacy that sort of creates black trauma, which in turn as it does in real life, often manifest in black on black violence. Mm-hmm. But is that me perhaps being a little over generous? Because maybe in retrospect, it was a little bit like, ah. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think that's probably that's probably there though, isn't it? I think. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things I'd, I'd, I'd almost need to sort of watch again. Because again, the the ending, right, in the police car... So, so good. good, but Candyman 
well, by that point, Candyman is sort of Anthony, right? But but he's sort of saving mm-hmm. her. Like he, he, she's not becoming his victim at that moment when she calls on him in the mirror. Um, yeah, so it's just an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? As to kind of who falls victim to Candyman and why? Why is it that Anthony deserved the fate, or why is it that Anthony was chosen to get the fate that he got? I suppose compared to other characters. Um, and that, and maybe it's to do with the, his link from when he was a baby and Cabrini. I don't know, but uh, well, yeah, it certainly suggests that that he was just selected back then, mm. and it was just a question of him being found again. And I, because, so it says a baby in Cabrini Green, he tried to set him on. He tried to immolate him. And I suppose that is there is there a sort of parallel as well between his story in this film and the original legend that he's. You know, they kind of imply, don't they, quite a lot that he's basically she's the she's the successful one in the couple, right? And he's had mm-hmm. a few successful paintings like two years ago and hasn't really done much since, essentially. And and so is kind of there's this idea, and she's for money, and she's, she's from, from money. Kind of- so he, so mm-hmm. these two people, you know, one from Cabrini Green originally, the other one from money, have fallen in love, and then essentially he's ended up becoming sort of destroyed because of that. And I suppose it in a similar trajectory to the way you know the original Tony Todd Candyman was back in the day so I guess there there are sort of parallels in some ways as well there's a sort of there's a lot of kind of class stuff coming into this as well isn't there as well as race I mean there are so many kind of layers here yeah which is interesting you don't normally see that in kind of black horror I mean in black films generally like acknowledgements of like that there is like class within the black community as well yeah, yeah. I mean I wish it had been more than just one scene, but I did enjoy that one scene about it. <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah. And what about, again, this was something I did not see coming, although I had a inkling at one point when he kept mm. talking about seeing his mother and I was like, are we going to know his mother? Oh my God, is it going to be Anne-Marie? And of course there is this reveal that he is Anne-Marie's child and she is in the trailer as well, isn't she? Yeah. Which is such a shame yeah. again. It's like, oh, I know. Um, <laughs> did you know that was, did you sort of know that was coming then? Did you assume that she was going to be his mum? Yeah, I knew that Anne-Marie was going to be in it. I knew that Tony Todd was having a cameo and I wish I hadn't mm-hmm. known both of those things. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it probably, I can't remember exactly when the trailer came out because there were the two trailers, weren't there? There was one that was also the shadow puppetry. Oh, yeah. And I wonder whether they kind of had to amp up what they revealed in the trailer because they had to restart the marketing because it was delayed a year. Yeah, yeah, um, very true. And, you know, I think it, it doesn't ruin the film to have have seen the trailer, but I am very jealous of you getting into it fresh. <laughs> yeah, I really loved that. I loved that connection that oh yeah. I'm gonna attempt to do this. And and, and no more trailers. And in a way it's yeah, it's so true. It's worth doing, honestly. So good. Be unsullied. Uh she um of course, you know, when you rewatch the first one, it's like, oh, she had a ba- her baby was called Anthony. Like she's quite, you know, that's there in the first film as well that that baby is called Anthony. So in in a way, they don't necessarily set it up to be like a huge shock twist reveal that he's that baby, but it's still a really cool, a really cool little link. I I kind of loved that about it as well that it's this yeah. now what thirty something year old man who was this little boy in the original. It's great. Yeah, I worked for Total Film a lot, and they had Candyman on their cover about this time last year. And um, my God, even that cover was a spoiler. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I think it was very difficult to go into this film and be surprised. Yeah, the cover that they had was literally like Yahya with a hook. <laughs> it was like okay, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I, you know, what can you do? Because you've got to market a film and it is a sequel. So people are going to know to a point what to expect anyway. But there are so many kind of fun surprises um, along the way with this one. Because again, because it, and this is such a thing at the moment, isn't it? That, you know, you have a sequel, but you basically call it the same film. You, you call it the same name. So it's not Candyman mm-hmm. 2 or Candyman 4 or whatever. It's just Candyman in the same way that Halloween 2018 was just Halloween and all this. Um, so you kind Ooh, of... Suicide Squad, the oh, Suicide Squad. That, I'm not sure what order that I is. I still don't understand that, Layla. <laughs> but anyway, that's a different conversation. But yeah, that idea that sort of, is it a reboot? Is it a sequel? Is it somewhere in between? 
I guess it's kind of a good, I guess it's a sort of interesting way of sort of saying to people, look, you don't, don't worry about it. You don't have to have seen the original. You can kind of come to this fresh and still enjoy it kind of thing, which I guess you can. Do you think that you would understand it? I think so. But you get so much more appreciation from having seen the original. Even like you say, the, the, the shadow puppet recreation of the first film of Helen's story and how it's wrong. I loved that little touch again, yeah. of how that idea of how folklore gets twisted and changed and, and passes through generations and it becomes something entirely different over time. Um, that was just such a great way of kind of summing that up, wasn't it? I think I loved that. Yeah, it is interesting that they do kind of depart from like these central motivations of Candyman in the first film because so much of that is that he wants to be infamous and there isn't really much of that in this one. One, and it's more there's this real sense of like that Anthony wants to be famous yeah so but like that doesn't necessarily I mean I suppose maybe it'll manifest now he's a candy man mm. <laughs> like, yeah. but like that was quite an interesting parallel that we didn't see that so much from the Tony Todd manifestation but we did get that from Anthony all the way through that's so and, true you know it worked and he does become famous even before he's a candy man he and he kind of revels in the fact that he's you know involved in a or sort of tangentially involved in a horrific murder yeah I love that it was such a clever moment that wasn't it when he was like oh, they said my name and you know he just wants to be known right for his work in the same way that candy man does and this is where the the movie works so well on multiple layers I think because you know, in some ways, this is your classic ghost story, um, like uh, Ring, right? Where, you know, the point of Samara or Sadako from The Ring is you have to pass on the videotape in order to survive or else you die. You have to keep the legend going. You have to keep her memory alive. Um, and there's something similar in a lot of movie monsters in that way. It's the same with Freddy Krueger, this idea that when he becomes forgotten and people aren't afraid of him anymore, he is destroyed. He ceases to exist. And that that is the case with Candyman to a point. You know, he has to be known. You have to say his name in order to bring him back. But, you know, not all of these different iterations of Candyman were like Anthony, where they wanted to be known when they were alive, right? The man from the 70s, Sherman, giving out sweets to kids. He didn't want to be famous or known. Like, he, you know, it wasn't about that. It's more about not silencing the crime, right? It's about that silent truth that's been there with us for hundreds of years about the treatment of black people that has been silenced. I guess it's about black suffering being silenced and Candyman is an embodiment of that breaking of the silence, right? Say my name, let's no longer be silent, let's talk about that monstrous thing that is black suffering. Yeah, maybe we are be misinterpreting that final scene with... Um Tiana Paris and Bri uh, you know uh, Brianna when she summons Carandy Man and he comes and he like massacres all of the horrific policemen um, who have just killed Anthony. Mm. That like rather than him coming into um, you know be her kind of you know savior in that moment, what he wants to do is kind of create a famous massacre. Yeah, and so like that you know otherwise that you know Anthony's death would just be unacknowledged, and it is a case of like oh okay, well another black man dying in you know the middle of the projects. Who's going to care about that? What I'm going to do is kind of make something really newsworthy. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? And that is even we just assumed he was saving his girlfriend. <laughs> it's true. It's true because again, that's like that's very overtly kind of said in the in the film, isn't it? That oh, the reason that Helen's story has become famous is because this was a white woman, you know, and what about all these other deaths mm -hmm. on Cabrini Green that have gone forgotten, you know? And yeah, that's so true. Although I couldn't help but think, again, there's something really bittersweet about that ending, isn't there? Because I couldn't help but think, would Brianna get out of that scot-free? She's probably not going to get out of that situation scot-free as she kind of walking away from that crime scene covered in blood with sort of dead policemen and dead bodies everywhere. You just think, oh, God. I mean, she is handcuffs at the time, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much trust we're supposed to have in the justice system. I suppose she's quite well off. Yeah. And it's like there is a dead body there they can kind of pin it all on. But, yeah, slightly worried for Brianna. Hoping those um, body cams were on, but again. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you just, I wanted to go and open a gallery in New York, you know? That's, that's yeah. <laughs> what did you think of her brother? Um, those extra kind of uh, periphery sort of characters in this story as well. Yeah, he 
was really I mean I think Nathan Stewart Jarrett is really witty and fun yeah really and good I don't think I've, the hell I don't think I've seen him since Misfits I feel like I, I I can't remember what else I've seen him in of late but it was great to see him yeah he was in um, a Amazon show about soulmates that was pretty decent and he was in that kind of comic book one a while ago but yeah Misfits is definitely what comes to mind when I think of him yeah. I do worry about kind of like whether we were getting a little bit too much into kind of sassy gay sidekick yes i agree a little but he did have some really great funny lines that reminded me of um the one of my favorite bits of comedy the eddie murphy rule scene about why um black people don't work in horror films. yeah too bad we can't stay <laughs> it's so good yeah yeah well he's just like you know it's just like black people don't need to be summoning shit yeah it's so true <laughs> that is and that eddie murphy sketch was kind of the the, the seed of the film get out even wasn't it yeah, yeah but it's so true there's a lot of that isn't there but i actually do love that these characters are quite smart in that regard you know um mm-hmm. Uh, there's that moment as well isn't there when Brianna kind of looks she goes to the laundrette and she opens that door down to the basement and she's just like nope and closes it again you know? <laughs> and like the fact that she refuses to say candy van in the mirror until the end all those things where these characters are like no I'm not fucking doing that you know I kind of <laughs> love that about it there weren't that many moments in this which is always quite unusual for horror where you're you know shouting at characters for doing really stupid things like on the whole they're all a pretty smart bunch aren't they really yeah <laughs> apart from the teenage girls maybe yeah <laughs> teenage girls I, mean, I probably would have said it into a mirror five times as a teenage girl where you know it's a miracle yeah. we survive anything really. <laughs> yeah but yeah no, I, I, it, it makes me kind of also a little bit hopeful for Nia da Costa's Marvel outing because I do think her and Tiana Paris are a very good pairing mm. like she does at first I did worry whether that character was going to be a little bit kind of killjoy of like, oh, guys, stop getting up to all of those things. But she sort of evolves into something much more complicated. Yeah. I could have done with actually spending a bit more time on her family history because I found all of that very interesting. Her scenes with the other art dealers, the way that she's kind of navigating herself as a professional woman, like... It's a really like rich character and like richer than it kind of needed to be, which I liked. Really good. And that relationship with Anthony too, right? And that kind of slight dependency there. And does she actually, she seems pretty happy with him at the beginning, but then you start to think as it goes on, like, is she basically sort of almost a bit stuck with him, you know? Um, Maybe they met like a couple of years ago and fell in love. And then since then there's, been a kind of struggle i don't know but i really liked the sort of nuances of their relationship too as it went on you know yeah and especially as you learn more about her father and you kind of get a sense of like maybe she's trying to fix him in the way that she wasn't able to help her dad yes exactly yeah which you know always goes super super well when you try to replicate with a man, a dysfunctional relationship that you have with your own father. <laughs> yeah. And fix them. Yeah. It always works yeah, great. That, right? Yeah, that's a great idea, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my God. Teenage girls, take heed. <laughs> Don't do that. It's so true. Don't summon Candyman. Don't try and fix men that are like your dad. Don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> um, yeah. So there you go. I, I, and, you know, again, like, there are some slightly more sort of caricature characters in this, but that's part and parcel of being this kind of a genre film, right? But like the uh, the, the gallery owner and the girl that he was going to have sex with in the gallery before they both get killed is... They're, they're all pretty kind of, you know, your standard kind of horror movie archetypes in a lot of ways, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, but you... You hate them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you hate him. She's sort of yeah. caught in the crossfire, isn't it? But yeah, no, that um, that is one of the funniest, I think, jokes about the morning after pill that's ever been committed to screen. That was good, like, wasn't I it? Did, I, I did a little guffaw in my uh, very silent screening room, and I think a lot of people judged me quite ha- harshly for it. But <laughs> yeah, it, it, he's, he's sort of that embodiment of like what we all think about when we think of like art world douches. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, this film has got a lot of art world douches, hasn't it, basically? You know, yeah. Peppered throughout. What was that bonkers yeah. movie with Tony Collette and Jake Gyllenhaal and everyone about art? Oh my God, was it called... Chainsaw or something. Yeah, chainsaw. But buzzsaw. Velvet, velvet like buzzsaw. Yeah. Right. It was that kind of a thing, wasn't it? Where it was like these kind of larger than life 
uh, art world characters. Yeah. I lived in Dalston in the early <laughs> noughties. Like, they aren't like that. There you go. There you go. You know firsthand. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, I quite liked his art as well with the cool mirror and the art things behind it, but that no one else was into yeah. it. I was like, this is cool. I took it very personally when they criticised it. <laughs> I was like, this is a really interesting way of framing the story. How dare you, sir? I know. Do you think there's anything there beyond what it is like do you think there's anything there that Nia Costa or Jordan Peele are saying about art and the way that this art is going to be perceived by people by critics anything like that I mean you know famously how you know M. Night Shyamalan often has you know like grumpy film critics in his movies or whatever you know is there anything to that about you know this movie being about a film about a legend kind of thing I wonder because I've, I've got a really wonderful uh, friend of mine who uh, black guy who sit, he has this theory that the reason that Get Out did so well is because it's fundamentally about white people <laughs> and I was thinking about that when I was watching those scenes in the gallery about like how maybe that was like a commentary on that about like that if you don't have white people in the center of stories about racism people aren't as interested and it's kind of something it's kind of a strange parallel but do you watch the 40 year old version last year and there's that kind of funny thing where they keep trying to she's writing a play and they keep trying to yep. insert bad white people yeah 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 <laughs> yeah yeah and like yeah i thought it was yeah i thought it was interesting in that like almost like they kept trying to make themselves central villains and like the black artists were just saying like no this just isn't about this you this isn't about all. you yeah that's so true actually um yeah that is really interesting because again like there were moments of it like for instance when i said you know near the beginning of the film it felt quite on the nose that they get they talk quite overtly from the start about gentrification and class and mm -hmm. money and race and all that stuff and it's very much kind of in the forefront in the text and then you know when it comes to that art gallery piece and the critic the critic accuses the the work of being didactic basically doesn't she she's like oh it's screamingly obvious what this piece of art is about and i, I suddenly felt very seen i was like oh mm. that's literally what i mean you've heard me say it already that's what i thought partly about this film and it's almost like Nia da Costa addressing that to us directly she's like yeah, yeah I, I know what you're thinking uh, it's, it was weird it's tough being a critic whenever there's a critic that appears in a film you're inevitably going to have like all your deepest insecurities <laughs> like laid out in front of you like that scene from Ratatouille oh, with the critic like cuts me deep every time so it's like am I really just a parasite on the back of everyone <laughs> else's creativity because that's always what it is always we're never helping no they're always <laughs> monsters, aren't they? Always absolute monsters. But that's fine. I, I get it. I get it. I'm here for it. Um, yeah. So there you go. Any other moments, any other highlights you want to talk about before we wrap up? I tell you what I really loved, talking of the kind of the, the sort of murder scenes. I liked the critic getting killed scene where it's kind of all done from sort of very sort of it's a big wide shot isn't it of the whole building yeah. and you suddenly see her kind of fly into the air and get kind of smashed against a window a couple of times but I, I really enjoyed that scene because to begin with you're like what am I supposed to be looking at here you know yeah no I was actually going to say the same thing the way that her kind of body is just like flung around yeah. like a kind of marionette and then the blood smears across. I thought that was just so cool. So cool. And just like another moment of like near to Costa when she could have done something quite straightforward and it would have been fine just being like, no, I'm just going to really think outside of the box mm. and make this really interesting. And like, I guess because I've watched so much, like I just always really respond to somebody doing something a bit odd. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And, you know, I, 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 it's, it's, it's filled with kind of cool set pieces and cool production design. I love the way that the kind of film opens with sort of the Chicago, but we're sort of looking up at it in that kind of like weird mist, as opposed to the kind of opening scenes of the 90s one, where it's kind of very much kind of helicopter, you know, looking down shot on the city, isn't it? And the way it's kind of flipped that and made it a bit weirder. But I love all of that, kind of, just the visual choices. And obviously the shadow puppetry as well, right? Which we haven't even talked about, but I loved yeah, all of that element it's beautiful oh and those slow zooms to get back to sort of like the, the slow zoom into the gallery the slow zoom into anthony walking across the chicago harbor mm. like the slow zoom out from the critic being horrifically murdered yes. like just anything like she's just got a real 
confidence with a camera oh doesn't she and like you said before we started recording corridors right amazing corridors corridors <gasps> and there is most of my notes are just corridors unbelievable <laughs> corridors and mirrors i loved it all i loved and this is the one bit i had been spoiled on actually because i hadn't watched the trailer but i had seen a still of i mm-hmm. think it is the moment in the um the critic's apartment when she's gone to the bathroom and he's looking towards the bathroom door and then she comes out and there's a sort of shot where it's kind of we've got him in the foreground looking behind him her looking yeah. back at him and then peeping round through the mirror is candy man and it kind of it just the depth of it and every, I, I just love it no, you just made me check all the words <laughs> <laughs> what i mean just awesome i love all of that kind of thing quite shining-esque i suppose in a way as well those kind of like long imposing corridors with sort of things hidden away but i love all of that yeah no that particular curved one that he walks down when he's going to visit his mother i think that was when i did an all caps corridors in <laughs> into my notebook yeah. but it's it's weird the stuff that can just really like stand out and you think so many films are kind of just paint by numbers like we just have to get from a to b to z yeah. and like and i feel that like within like the modern rotten tomato sphere of criticism you can actually do pretty well being quite mediocre and not doing much that's unexpected and everything is skewed to kind of reward that yeah the three star movie kind of thing yeah yeah Yeah. and it was really nice to just see so many bold swings and somebody just being like this is someone walking down a corridor to see their mother and i'm just gonna friggin go for it (laughs) i'm gonna create something that like you know, I've seen maybe 40 films since then and I can picture that corridor so beautifully. It's so true. So, yeah. Everything felt like it's there to be enjoyed. Even, yeah, moments like that, like you say, where we're, we're just moving from A to B or whatever. Um, yeah, it's absolutely awesome. So do you think we're going to get more? Are you? Uh, do you want more Candyman films after this or is this it for like another 20 years, I wonder? Yeah, I don't want any more, really. Yeah. Um, I'm good. I think like that's the uh, the problem. I I actually don't. I'm like I said. I'm going to the Venice Film Festival in a week, and I will be seeing Halloween Kills <laughs> yes. the second that I can. But I've actually would have been okay with not having any more of that. Like I think unless there's like a real reason to bring something new to a story, which this did, and I think to a certain degree Halloween did by kind of reframing it as all being like trauma and feminism or whatever. Yeah. But like now that we've done that, I don't know what more there is to bring to it yeah like it's really cool we're gonna like reframe him as an anti-hero we're gonna you know take this person and see say that like you can see a massacre from one person's point of view and from another point of view Mm -hmm. it is a hugely heroic act and someone storming in to save the day great i I'd just rather see some more kind of original properties. Very excited for Jordan Peele's Nope. Oh, my God. I, I've bagged myself to review that with a, with a, one of the magazines I work for. Oh, my God. I'm just so excited. Uh, every You know, everything he does, I'm kind of 100% in for, you know. Um, I even love the Twilight. Yeah. I even love the Twilight Zone, which a lot of people... I are, love the Twilight right? Zone. People are really hard on the Twilight Zone. I don't understand why. I will even defend the octopus episode of the Twilight <laughs> yes. Zone. I'm, I'm here for every episode. So it's incredible it. yeah i'm 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 so here for more jordan peele i'm here for more near the costa horror as well like you say it's yeah. awesome that she's doing marvel absolutely awesome but please don't let that be all she does now you know <laughs> and i think that he's really somebody that's like shown himself to kind of do some really cool stuff for black women i mean not just near the costa but i think lupita nyong'o oh. in us is the greatest role that she's ever been given 100 percent. so yes 100 percent. she's here for intersectional allies Jordan Peele 100% uh, Lupita Nyong'o that's one of those roles kind of like Tony Collette right where it was like ridiculous that she didn't get an Oscar nod or any kind of award nod really for that as well yeah but yeah, yeah. more of that more of that um, oh and I've got to ask you before we finish as well Tony Todd's little cameo at the end what did you think of that did that did you appreciate that I think the problem was like, obviously it was lovely to see Tony Todd, but because I knew there was a cameo and I knew the film was 90 minutes, <laughs> and I knew that it was ending. And yeah. I was like, yeah, here he comes. The, the, yeah. yeah. Oh. But good to see him. And, um, you know, 
what 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 a presence that man is and just how he's he's still he's still got it oh he's my still... god well have they done anything to his face to make him look the same age as he did in the 90s or does he just look amazing still because like when you see him in that very brief moment i was like oh my god he still looks about 30 years old or something as well at that point yeah <laughs> i feel like now i have to insert some sort of like stereotypical racist joke about black not cracking no like, <laughs> <laughs> He does look amazing. Hey, I have an extensive moisturizing regime. <laughs> I am not going to be relying on genetics for that. But yes, the man looks absolutely fantastic. Maybe he has an extensive uh, moisturizing regime, you know. So I assume so. I think he must be bathing in the blood of virgins or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I loved it because I, again, not to not to brag, but didn't know any of that and didn't know it was coming. And I was and I even had to do a slight double take because they do something weird where his face kind of merges into Tony Todd's. And I was like, hang on, wait, is that what? I loved it. Absolutely loved it. That was. Well, they slightly hinted it coming earlier when he's doing those big oh, portraits, and yeah. one of them from a distance does look like it's Tony Todd's face. Loved that. Yeah. It does. It does exactly. Yeah, it really does look like Tony Todd's face. Yeah, that was a that was a chilling, chilling moment as well. I loved it. Oh, loved all the visuals. So good, uh, and also a kind of twist on the original score too, right? A kind of much more yes. minimal, kind of stripped back version of the original beautiful score. Which I, I really like there were some moments I think especially early on where she sort of like abstracts bass in this weird way that like makes you feel slightly nauseous mm -hmm. is that just me yeah no no no, that, no 100% <laughs> that kind of rumbly kind of yeah yeah um, and yeah and it worked so well across that kind of chilling but slightly melancholy sort of final closing credits didn't it as well it was perfect kind of yeah just, I think she like fosters like this just real unease for a minute one mm. that sort of carries through the, the entire thing yeah yep. very talented lady and it's funny because if you watched little again i had to interview her and they gave me nothing so i just, I just feel like i'm very up to speed with her entire back catalogue i've seen her shorts i've seen her films i've seen the episodes of top boy that she directed <laughs> and like you wouldn't necessarily get that yeah from the other stuff that she's done yeah yeah I, it's really i mean like obviously there's a there's a real range there, isn't there? And I'm guessing. I mean, I what which Marvel is it? The Marvels is that what she's doing next? No, I think she's doing Captain Marvel two. Yes, which is the one with Brie Larson. Yes, but I think Tiana Paris is like a big part in it. I don't I don't really know Marvel law, but I think maybe you know there's that thing where sometimes multiple people. Like, oh, I'm Captain Marvel now. Yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're going very multiverse as well, aren't they, in the next sort of wave of films, which is very confusing if you're not a Marvel geek, but yeah. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you go. Well, um, thank you, Layla. Thank you so much for, for joining me to discuss Candyman. pleasure. You believe that, like, we actually, we're probably not sure of how long the actual film is in I terms know. of, like, how long it And I feel like I've... Which I'm, is just how packed I, it is. And I feel like I'm going to stop this conversation and then suddenly be like oh shit I forgot to mention this or that but it's, it's one of those films isn't it it's going to be hopefully hopefully one that everyone will enjoy at the moment we're recording this it's all very heavily embargoed and not many people have seen it so we don't know what the reaction is going to be like but I feel like this is going to be regardless of whether critics on the whole enjoy it I feel like it's going to be a crowd pleaser too right I mean I think it's got yeah. enough really fun popcorn thrills in there as well as having all of that kind of meatier stuff as well that I feel like it's going to play well don't you think with audiences yeah I definitely think it will I wonder whether its legacy is going to be more about the kind of career that it launched than mm, mm -hmm. it being remembered in itself um but kind of only time will tell. It is always quite weird watching these things in a bit of a bubble it and is. just kind of to read the screening room that you're in. But I, I think everybody that I saw it with seemed to be really vibing with it. I think it was certainly really interesting. I I know that I just, you know, spent way too much time thinking about it and there was far too much build up. So I might have a kind of slightly skewed perception, but there's certainly a lot there. And I think for horror fans, that's what we appreciate. We appreciate a lot of ideas and a lot of big swings and stuff that we haven't seen before. So yeah, always. I think certainly for our weird crowd. <laughs> 100%. It's a good month, actually, for horror. We've got Sensor, right? And The Night House and Candyman. It's like, oh, this is good stuff coming our way now. This is lovely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so there you go. Well, Layla, thank you so much. And just um, remind us, if people want to come and find you and find more of your work out there, where can they find it? Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter, Layla underscore Latif, where I post most of the things I've done. But oh, I, I've done. I, I do. But uh, yeah, aside from that, I'm pretty much in every issue of Total Film, every issue of Sight and Sound, every issue of Little White Lies. And I do quite a lot with the AV Club. So I'm about. You're very busy. Very busy. Uh, I, I am busy. I, I cannot say no to anything, especially <laughs> talking about films that I love. So, you know, what they say, if you find a job that you love, you never work a day in your life. Exactly. Yeah, that exactly that. Uh, and final question, which I ask all my new guests, Layla, what's your favourite horror movie? Hmm, probably Jaws. Oh, amazing choice. Yeah, I'm very, very, in my interests outside of film are pretty much marine biology and baking so <laughs> that's i mean if there if there isn't any baking in jaws but that would have really made it perfect if only for me. if only oh amazing choice layla thank you so much for joining me pleasure And that's it for this week's bonus episode. A huge thank you once again to my brilliant guest, Layla Latif. Layla will be back on our main Aliens series again in the next few months, so keep an ear out for her. Uh, so I would love to hear from you guys now. What do you think of Nia DaCosta's Candyman? How does it compare to the original Candyman, in your opinion? Send me your thoughts. Evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. And don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd and if you want to discuss this week's episode if you want to discuss Candyman with fellow Evolution of Horror listeners and fellow horror fans then join the discussion group that's called the Evolution of Horror discussion group and that can be found on Facebook. We're also on Patreon if you want to help support the making of this podcast you can get treated to regular bonus episodes over on Patreon this weekend me and Louise Blaine are bringing you Fright Fest coverage that's right, the UK's biggest horror and genre festival is back uh, and we are going to be bringing you little mini episodes every single day throughout the festival uh, updating you on some of the best and worst movies that we've seen at Fright Fest. So if you want to get involved, sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can find all previous seasons and episodes of this podcast on our website, evolutionofhorror.com. And you can find this podcast in all the normal podcast places. Please hit subscribe if you can. And if you get a spare minute, I would be so grateful if you could drop us a little rating and review on Apple Podcasts, as that really helps us get discovered by by new listeners. So, we'll be back with another regular edition of Evolution of Horror. New episodes drop every single Friday. So, join us again very soon for all of this and more on the Evolution of Horror. Evolution of Horror.